Is your worship on Sunday centered on Jesus? Next on the Ex-Mormon Files. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I appreciate you joining with us. And today we have Susan Rose. Sure, sure, sure glad to have you here, Susan, and uh, sharing your very interesting story. And you've got a lot of little anecdotes and things that are just fascinating. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about your beginning. Where were you born and brothers and sisters, that kind of stuff? Well, okay. I was born in Indiana. I had... Uh, Family of five, good okay. Irish Catholic. Family, um, huh? Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, we moved to California when I was about eight. Mm. And my dad became an iron worker in local 433 and remained in that local the rest of his life. Now, was that in Los Angeles, was it? That was in okay. Los Angeles. Yeah. And uh, I grew up in Orange County met my husband at Fullerton Junior College. Okay. We got married in 1965. Wow. Um, now, were you, were you born Mormon or were, what were no, you? No. You, oh, you said I, Irish Catholic, no, I guess, is I, that right? I attended Catholic school from first grade to seventh grade. And I began in Indiana. And I remembered when I was like, five years old, we had a little Baltimore catechism. <laughs> and uh, the question was, why, uh, why did God make me? And the answer was to know, love, and serve God. Mm. And I, I've got to tell you, in preparing for you, your interview, yeah. I've had visual like pictures of the events that I'll talk about. You know, your, from your past and so on. Uh, yeah. Well, I hope you get to share all those. If no, you can remember no. Them. Oh. <laughs> but um, my husband was raised Lutheran. Oh, okay. And uh, we got married um, in the Catholic Church. Now, this was in '65. Were you still Catholic then? Okay. You I was still Catholic. Catholic. Okay. And uh, then we moved up to San Jose for his schooling. Okay. And uh, we had our first child, and I guess I was about 26. And my grandfather, who was Irish, by the way, yeah. he was a saint. I mean, as far as I was concerned, I'd never heard him raise his voice or be angry. He was just <laughs> a calm, hardworking, honest, loving grandfather that that's would bring great. me ice cream when they watched me, you know. And um, when he died, I could not accept the the Catholic teaching of purgatory. That, I that's could, where he went. It, I had, at about fifth grade, I had had a priest come into our classroom. I was about 10 or 11. Yeah. And the priest said, you will all burn for a while in purgatory, but you won't burn up. It'll just keep burning. And you can be there for years. And the only way you can avoid it is if you pray enough and go to mass enough and take communion enough. And that's even maybe the Pope has to go there for a little while. So when now when I'm adult and my grandfather dies, I could not accept that. Oh. I could not. Yeah. So along comes the Mormons and... Um, Were they missionaries? They came the missionaries, or? a neighbor down the street that was a sweetheart of an elderly lady, yeah. Lida Goff. And, um, <laughs> and they said, families forever three levels of heaven, outer darkness. And I said, that sounds good to me. Sounds better than purgatory. Right. <laughs> and so then I went from obey and pray, you know, pray and obey the leaders to pray, obey, and pay the leaders. <laughs> and, and each time I, I look at it like this. 
every person that's born gets a pair of man-made glasses, lenses they see the world through. And I was switching my glasses from Catholic yeah. to Mormon. And now I don't wear glasses <laughs> to see the lenses except yeah. through Jesus Christ. And those are supernatural, not man-made. So uh, I joined the church. Then Bob joined shortly after we were sealed in the Oakland Temple. What year was that? Do you remember? I can't remember. Yeah. I would, I would guess it was somewhere around nineteen seventies, maybe. Okay, so maybe five years after you were married. You said you were married in sixty-five. Yeah, yeah, that sounds about right. Okay, and so we were. We were dedicated, and then Bob got a job working in Salt Lake, and we came to Salt Lake to see if we were supposed to be here, and we felt we were. Yeah. And so we moved here, and he worked here, and we proceeded mm. to have um, eight children. Oh, my goodness. And... Um, that's awesome. And, and now, this raised was, them all Mormon. We active. raised them uh, for part of their life Mormon. Oh, okay. But um, we had those children. The one thing that Catholic school had taught me, my mom and dad had taught me, my grandfather that walked to church with me had taught me, is God does hear our prayers. And I had had enough instances where praying personally to God and Jesus, he heard my prayers. You knew that and, he was there to answer prayers, yeah. Right. And there were some supernatural miracles that saved my life and some of the children of friends of my father's um, that were enormous miracles. Um, that I believed in the supernatural, I believed in Christ. Yeah. And so that belief in Christ kept me going. But I, I had taken it for granted Christ was who those leaders told me he was. In Mormonism, you mean? And, yeah. And, yeah. And so, um, but... I still prayed directly to him. And then um, I have to say my transition yeah. out of Mormonism came from uh, John Taylor and B.H. Roberts. <laughs> oh, really? <And> so, <laughs> That's an unusual source for what yeah, they They ushered me out. Um, John Taylor, I was, you know, the idea was in both faiths, you work your way to heaven. Yeah, Catholic you know, and Mormon, uh, yeah. You, you're like a little hamster on a wheel and you work your way up, yeah. you know. And you, you be righteous enough before you come to Christ. Yeah, that's what they expect. Yeah. You know. <laughs> right. And <clears throat> so John Taylor in a discourse, asked the question, is there progression between kingdoms? He wasn't saying there was. He asked the question, could even Satan be saved? Mm. And I thought, wow. That's an interesting. Uh, that's really interesting. And so then um, later on, um, I had been reading the Bible, and I read John 1. I won, but John 17, I can remember where I was when I was reading John 17. His, the, the prayer and, of Jesus. Huh? And it was Jesus talking before his crucifixion. Yeah. And I remember reading that. And But then after I read John Taylor's book, yeah. I mean, Discourse, I found a letter from David O. McKay, allegedly, to a member saying no prophet had ever 
said there was or was not progression between, between kingdoms. kingdoms. And so um, I thought, well, if there is progression, then God is very kind, infinitely patient, and he wants all of us home. But if you adopt that, then why do you need the church? <laughs> and, and why do you need to obey commandments? Because then you get out of it with repentance and just keep, keep going. It takes a little longer, but, yeah. you know. And the confusion between the prophets, too. Is kind right, of, yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. And then if there is no progression, then God is very judgmental. He's got a hammer up there waiting to just let it fall when you screw up, you know. And I thought, okay, if there's no progression, I'm not going to make it. <laughs> I, I am. Uh, God made me imperfect, so apparently he wants me to serve just other people and be a servant and not a member of the family. And I won't have my family with me, and God yeah. doesn't love me. Did you understand grace at this point? No. No. And, and there was a priesthood manual that said there was no progression between kingdoms, and it was under the committee of uh, Bruce R. McConkie yeah. at the time. But I noticed that no prophet said that. And I really believed that God didn't love me then. He, oh. Uh, he, it was so layered, celestial, terrestrial, terrestrial, sure. you know. And I just believed that I was defective, and, that, and I, I couldn't make it. That you, you weren't. <laughs> and then. That's depressing, isn't it? <laughs> and then I got thinking about my temple garments. Yeah. They're my burial clothes. Do you realize I've, every day I was putting on burial clothes? And so I went to the bishop and said to the bishop, I feel very depressed putting on temple garments. He said, look, I'll send you to this counselor that counsels out at the prison and see what he says. So I went to him and he says, tell you what, here's a note. Take your garments off for a week see what you think. So I went and took them off, went to Fredericks of Hollywood, got a red bra and red pants. <laughs> and I went living without my temple garment. And I went to a garage sale. Mm. And at this garage sale, uh, a sailboat fell over. And it had a big metal mast and it brushed my shoulder and knocked me down. And I wasn't hurt, but I got thinking, I didn't have any garments on. Garments didn't save me. And then I thought of my father being injured and almost dying in an iron worker accident. Yeah. And the times I had almost died, and I thought, wait a minute. It's not the garments that save you. It's Jesus and the angels he commands. So then... That's very enlightening. Huh? <laughs> um, so then uh, I went to the Marriott Library, and I found the manuscript, the actual manuscript, the paper it was on, <laughs> from uh, B.H. Roberts. I thought, oh, I love reading B.H. Yeah. Roberts. Yeah. Here's this manuscript that he typed. I mean, this is great. And it was his review of View of the Hebrew oh, with boy. pages, dozens of pages of single space, double column comparison. Comparing the Book of Mormon to the View of the so Hebrews. So I, I said, that's it. It's not real. And that was my aha moment. <laughs> and I took the book and I threw it outside in the trash bin. And when I did, there was a big lightning bolt that hit the mountains over it by Bingham. <laughs> and I thought, well, okay, I hope that's an approved, you know, it's approval. A little sign from God. <laughs> you know, that it's okay. <laughs> and, um, 
And so um, <laughs> I, I left the church, and, um, but I didn't leave Christ. I mean, Christ. I'm, I'm proud of you for that. That's, I mean, doesn't Christ, always happen, does it? No, and I think maybe when I was 13, uh, I went to an after-school meeting with an uh, evangel, you know, a, a Christian, hmm. and I remember him asking us, "Do you want Jesus to be your best friend?" And I said, "Yes," and I remembered that. You know, and you've carried that with you all these years. Uh, yeah, I didn't know him his personality real well, right. but but then I realized uh, that he was be my friend. Yeah. Well, then in um, two thousand, um, and I, and I have to say this while I was LDS. God heard my prayers. He heard our family's well, sure. prayers. Sure, He loves you. And and I believe He just He died for Mormons. He died for every person I meet. Yeah. They every person is priceless to Him. He cannot love them any more than He loves them, and He is love. I agree totally with that. I think the difference is the way we look at him, don't you think? Yes. I mean, as Mormons, he was just our older brother, and he just kind of, he's working his way to godhood. But, uh, and and uh, as Christian, he is God. <laughs> but Jesus said, he said, all you have to do is accept my love. Yeah. And so, anyway, um, in 2000, uh, our granddaughter was born premature and died in childbirth. Oh. And then 60 days later, my daughter, her mother, died in a car wreck. And um, hmm. my husband and I divorced. Um, as do maybe about 89 or 95 percent of couples where they have a child die. It's really what I, what a, uh, Yeah, what they don't tell you is men like to go in their man cave while women have to talk about it. And so the women get the idea that the man doesn't care, and the man gets the idea that uh, the women are just bugging them. You think it's that kind of... And so then um, my husband and I divorced, and then later we reconciled. And it was a few months after our daughter Erin died, I had a dream. And I heard my aunt laughing. She had a very distinctive laugh. I said, that's Aunt Rose. Someone that had passed away already. Yeah. yeah, I said, that's Aunt Rose. And and suddenly I was in this like waiting area with a little bench <clears throat> and my deceased family was there. And here was our daughter oh. holding her baby in this pearl essence white gown and gown for the baby and they're all laughing they're all having a big party and over to the side bent over holding his ribs is Jesus and Jesus came over to this table and sat across from me as if to say I've got this Susan <laughs> and I've got this. I thought Wow, and I tried to reach through, but there was a barrier. Well, six months later or so, there was a television show on people that have dreams before they pass. And one lady had a dream where there was a candle on one side of the window, and it went out and was relit on the other side. And I said, that's it. That 
that barrier is dimensional. It's just, they're in that dimension and I'm in this dimension. Yeah. But that comforted me. And after that, I didn't worry about it. I think God knows how to to touch your heart and to show him how show you how much he loves you. Yeah. And and he does that for every person. But then my husband and I began looking f we withdrew our names from the church um as did our family but before this happened but then we began looking for a church and for a short time it went back charismatic catholic yeah. but then I left that and then my husband and I found Franz Davis Calvary Baptist Church, and through that church we found Fill the Pot Ministry. Well, bef before we talk about Fill the Pot Ministry, uh, how did you feel about that worship there at that uh, Baptist Church? Well, I loved it. Compared to, say, Mormonism, I guess I always um, want to make that comparison, but did you feel a sense of worship of Jesus? At oh, ab absolutely. and. Um, uh, I have to tell you that when I was in Indianapolis, when I was little, yeah. uh, down the street and across the corner was a Pentecostal church. Yeah. And so on warm evenings, you could find me sitting on the curb, tapping my feet, listening to, to them their music. sing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you so, remember that. <laughs> oh, I do. And, and so uh, before I went back well, while I was in college, I went to Franz Davis's church mm -hmm. with my friend from Germany and her parents to show her Americana, you know. Yeah. And he gave a talk, and I'll never forget the talk. And it said, God did not make you an eagle so that you could fly off a cliff and crash, die, burn up in flames. <laughs> He made you an eagle so you could fly. Yeah. And that got me through some very rigorous university studies mm -hmm. and challenges. Yeah. And now I've come to know Christ. And I know his nature. And I'm solid with that. He, he, he's with me and all of us. A hundred percent of the time. And don't you feel a sense of freedom and liberty in that knowledge? Totally. Yeah. I mean, um, one of the things being in a church does is it makes life very predictable because you plan it out around a lot of different yeah. I, activities. But when it's just Jesus, <laughs> he says quite often, Surprise, got something for you today. Yeah. And if you want to know your plan of life, forget it. He's not going to tell you. But if you trust him. Like you said, he, he's sitting there saying, I got this. <laughs> right, yeah. right. And um, he wants us, truth is everything. Yeah. And there was one psychologist, Mormon psychologist, that said there's two kinds of Mormons. One's validity and one's utility. What happens if I leave to the family and how's it going to affect? Yeah. The other one is if it's truth, good. If it's not truth, I'm out of here. <laughs> and, and so my parents were very independent minded and they were very truth oriented people. And they taught you that. And so, despite the fact that they were unconventional and <laughs> had burdens to overcome, and yeah. we did not have a leave it to beaver family life, uh, they gave me the courage to follow truth wherever it leads you. Yeah. And always, always love your family. So tell us about Fill the Pot Ministry. How did that get started? Well, Bob and I, uh, they were, Jay and Tony Ragsdale was. Yeah, tell us a story. They, about okay, his. they were working with uh, Calvary Baptist Church. But before that, Jay and Tony and another couple 
were looking for Jay's brother, who was homeless. And they couldn't find him, couldn't find him. And so finally they got a big coffee pot and donuts and just gave him out at Pioneer Park. And, and to... to uh, and, and, and in two him. weeks, his brother showed up. But then people just kept bringing food. And pretty soon they had tables they set up and pretty soon little tents. And, and this was like every Sunday, right? Right, every yeah. Sunday. And they were giving clothes out. So my husband and I asked Jay and Tony if we could come one week, and she said, sure. And I said, what do, you, what do we bring? She said, anything you want. <laughs> so we brought um, six, no, five six-pound bags of frozen fruit, because at that time there wasn't a lot of fruit. So five six-pound frozen bags like this, and we began dishing them out, and we fed over 260 people. Out of those people, probably only about 10 or 12 um, said, no, thank you. And at the end of the day, we still had an unopened bag of fruit. After two, wow. <laughs> That's food multiplying. Yeah. Another time, a woman needed a pair of 10 wide shoes for winter. And there were no white shoes, no... I looked in the shoe box, I couldn't find anything. And a man walked up to me with new white tennis shoes, handed them to me, and walked off. <laughs> and I knew those were going to fit her like a glove. And they and did. They did. And she, she said, I used to have a pair of shoes like that, and they were my very favorite ones. Oh, my goodness. And so it's, it, I said, mm-hmm, okay. Amazing how God works, isn't it? <laughs> uh, it's terrific. It's terrific. And, and uh, if I had anything to say to my family. Yes, please. God is love. Jesus is love. We don't earn love. We relax and we give our imperfect heart to him. He gives his perfect heart to us. That's and beautiful. if there are any Mormon people, you have been my hero in so many respects. And God loves you. He wants, he doesn't need a middleman. Just come to him. That's beautiful. And like you say, uh, the scripture is, he that believeth in me hath everlasting life. And that's what he asks of it. That's all he wants from us is our heart and our love. If anyone wants to know Jesus, read John 17. <laughs> John 17 and John 1. Yeah. Jesus is God and Jesus. He, he loves you so much. Not for what you do, but for the love he put in you. Just come to him. We just can't earn our way. He's already done. It's done. Us. I mean, he when he died, the curtain split to open the Holy of Holies. And John 17 says, Jesus, it says, the Father loves you as much as he loves Jesus. And two, Jesus said, for us to be one with him as he is one with the Father. Mormons don't like to leave the church be because they're afraid of losing their family. Jesus seals our family to him with his heart, yeah. his love. And I can't depend on me being perfect enough the Mormon way. Right. But his way, he's perfect. He's got us there together. Susan, that's a, a great story and a great testimony. And thanks so much for sharing. Thank you. You're a for, delight. Thank you for inviting <laughs> me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll see you next time on the Ex Mormon Files.